Thank you very much for having me here and uh, walk uh, through some science uh, with you this morning. But uh, don't worry, I'll make it very clear and understandable because that is our purpose, the purpose of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, who has received a task in 2009 to produce a comprehensive, transparent and open report on what the science knows about anthropogenic climate change. 259 authors, scientists all around the world have been charged in Working Group 1, the physical science basis, to assess what we know about climate change. They have produced a voluminous work, over 1,500 printed pages, which are organized in 14 chapters and an atlas, totaling over a million words. Now you may say, is that relevant to us? Well, it is the scientific basis, contains all the details that the scientists have learned, but we are also aware of the fact that our message could be buried and blurred in a million words. That's why we wrote a summary for policymakers, which contains about 14,000 words. 14,000 words print on around 30 pages, and this is still too much for a CEO or a policymaker to digest. This is in fact the criticism that we have most often received uh, at the occasion of the fourth assessment report which was published in 2007. People have said you're too complicated and you're too long. So we've taken that message and indication to our hearts and produced now for the first time within the summary for policymakers succinct and short messages, so-called key headlines, 19 of which print on fewer than two pages. So I can stand now in front of you and uh, without blushing and being embarrassed, I can claim that there is no more excuse for any CEO or policymaker not to have time to read our conclusions nor not to be able to understand them. Because I will show to you uh, a few of these headline messages which are simple and quotable and uh, the metric that uh, we have for this is the fact that many of these headline statements were taken verbatim in the media and printed around the world. Now, this is the team of scientists I had the privilege to lead through the process of four years. A very cumbersome process. But it's remarkable that in this day of age, scientists are ready on a voluntary and unpaid basis to extract the knowledge from over 9,000 scientific publications into this report. The report has undergone two rounds of review, collecting over 54,000 review comments, all of which had to be addressed and responded to. It's an unprecedented effort by the scientific community and I'm extremely grateful for my colleagues who have worked on this report for the past four years. It is not the first report IPCC has produced. In fact, it's the fifth one. The first one was produced in 1990 in preparation of the Rio conference in 1992. And ever since then, at the rate of about one report per five or six years, the science has been updated and the policymakers have been informed on about what we know about climate change, including the uncertainties and the open questions. I would like to explain to you what we found out in our working group, the Physical Science Basis on Climate Change, organizing our messages on three pillars, observations, understanding and the future. Here you see a map of the world which shows the warming that uh, has been extracted from millions of data observed around the world over the past 112 years. Warming is seen in almost all the places of this planet. We're also very open to inform the policymakers where we cannot make a statement. These are the white areas where there is still an absence of observations, in particular in the Southern Ocean and over Antarctica. But overall, the message is clear, it's warming, and this has led us to 
provide one very simple message to the policymakers. Warming of the climate system is unequivocal. That's the voice of the science, bolstered by many thousands of observations and scientific publications. This is a graph that has not made it into the summary for policymakers because we felt it was a little bit too complicated. But for a physicist, this is probably the most fundamental graph when it comes to climate change. You see a curve here that starts in 1970 and runs to the year 2010. It shows the change in energy content in the climate system arguably the most important quantity if you look at the climate system. Over 250 times 10 to the 21 joules of energy have been stored in addition in the climate system. Primarily in the world's ocean, in the sky blue you see the fraction of energy that is stored in addi in additionally in the top 700 meters of the world ocean. The dark blue indicates the energy that is stored in greater depths than 700 meters. And the three slivers at the bottom of this curve indicate the energy change of the cryosphere, the ice bodies that requires energy to melt the ice, to heat up the soil, and finally to heat up the atmosphere. In a way, this uh, diagram depicts the paradoxical situation that today we are fixated on looking at the increase of temperature in the atmosphere and yet from a scientific energetic point of view this is not at all important. Important it was is stored in terms of energy in the ocean. Now these are huge numbers and I just give you one number here that perhaps may relate to something you are familiar with. In the ocean today, since 1970, an additional 70 million terawatt hours of energy have been stored. This is 500 times more than the consumption of energy of the entire planet in one year today. This energy, of course, has been stored through the action of the increased concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, primarily carbon dioxide. Here is a pertinent observation and reconstruction. You see the natural variations of carbon dioxide, the most important greenhouse gas in the atmosphere after water vapor, over the past 800,000 years. And I'm proud to say that uh, in my institute we have performed these measurements which are based on the oldest ice core that we retract from Antarctica, which stores a climate history of the past 800,000 years. Carbon dioxide has never been constant, but it has varied in concert with the ice ages, of which you see eight complete cycles on this graph. To the very right of the graph, I plotted the current observations and direct measurements of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And you see that they skyrocket. They are at 400 ppm currently in the atmosphere, which is 30% higher than any value that we have measured in this ice core. In other words, man has changed the composition of the atmosphere in terms of its greenhouse gas content. That is why one of the other headlines in our summary for policymakers says the concentration of CO2 have increased to levels unprecedented in at least the last 800,000 years. Here is another diagram that shows some unprecedented changes. It shows the CO2 emissions in billion tons of carbon per year all over the world since 1980. 2013. 2013 is a record year, as almost all previous years we have written record emission one year after the next. In the past year we have emitted about 10 billion tons of carbon per year. 
That is another uh, kind of interesting side observation. Since 1992, which is a time point where we can arguably say the world community was aware of the impending climate problem, because that is when the Rio conference uh, was held, since then the emissions have increased by 61%. CO2 emissions by human activity are unprecedented. Let me now come to the second um, area, second pillar in our summary for policymakers, where we present the understanding, the causes of the observed changes. Here are the observations superimposed on climate model simulations of the global mean temperature over the past 110 years. The observations are given in the black curve. The red and the blue curve indicate model means, whereas the uh, blurred curves in blue and yellow indicate individual model simulations from over 25 modeling centers around the world. You see that the major time evolution of temperature is very well captured. In particular, also volcanic eruptions that occasionally occurred in the 20th century and which led to a temporary cooling of the global mean temperature. We can say now that model reproduce observed continental scale surface temperature patterns and trends over many decades. But wait a minute. Don't we read often in the media that there is a warming pause, that there is a time since 1998, where the planet hasn't warmed. If I asked you here in this room, I'm sure everybody would raise their hands to have heard about this. Let's take a closer look at what the models have to tell us over this remarkable period of the last 15 years. Okay, here is an enlargement. Of that whole 110 year, this is the portion that the media have been focusing on in the past three years. And I can tell you as a co-chair of working with one of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, this has been a personal challenge to me and the team to bring about the best possible scientific response that we can bring to this phenomenon, which scientifically is indeed a very interesting one. This period has been used, or rather abused, to say that the climate models are no good and therefore we cannot trust the projections. But let's take a closer look. The starting year of this period is marked by a very strong El Nino event, which causes in itself a temporary warming. In other words, the starting time of this 15-year period already contains a bias. Here I show a few of these model simulations in the fine lines, plus the observations in the thick line, plus an estimate of the trend over the last 15 years given in the dashed line. And it is this apparent disparity between the gray shaded area, which is the model mean, and the one realization of the observations that people and media have made a focus of in their reporting about the quality of climate models. But let's pick just one simulation out of these many simulations available. For example, this one highlighted in blue. If we analyze decadal trends in this simulation, then indeed there is a remarkable difference between the decadal trend from 1998 to 2012 as simulated compared to the observed. An overestimate of the trend which is apparent to every eye. But then the next 15 years given in blue or another 15 years in the future given in purple. You see that that very same model simulation is capable of simulating various 15-year trends ranging from almost zero to a very steep trend superimposed on what is a long-term increasing in temperature 
over many decades. Take another simulation. This one here agrees quite well with the observations. But later on, from 2020 to 2035, you see uh, a large trend indeed indicated in green, followed by a lower trend indicated in purple. In other words, decadal trends are not really suitable to look at and analyze and quantify when we are looking at a long-term climate change problem. And I illustrate this uh, recalling again this figure that I've shown you, the simulations compared to the observations over the past 110 years. And here, compared to the same simulations which exclude the increase of greenhouse gases over the 20th century as observed. You see that these simulations do not show the warming that is so pronounced after about 1950 and therefore are inconsistent in quantifying the climate change over the 20th century. Carbon dioxide is needed to explain what we see. And therefore we conclude it is extremely likely that human influence has been the dominant cause of the observed warming since the mid-20th century. Another of these 19 headline statements in the summary for policymakers. We can go further and now systematically investigate the cause and effect relationship of what we observe in terms of increase of carbon dioxide and what we observe in the changes in the climate system. We observe changes in the atmosphere, on land, in the ocean, some of which I've shown you. We also see changes in the statistics of extreme events. For example, more heat waves, more intense heat waves around the globe. We identify changes in the water cycle. Where it is dry, it has become drier. Where it is wet, it has become wetter over the past 50 years. We see melting sea ice in the Arctic. We see glaciers dwindling and we see ice sheets melting. And above all, a global integrator is the sea level rise, which is unequivocal. Sea level has risen by 19 centimeters worldwide since the year 1900. All of these pieces of evidence together are encapsulated in this, what is probably the simplest of all headline statements in the summary for policymakers. It simply says human influence on the climate system is clear. Now when the scientists have proposed this sentence to the delegates of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and these are all the nations of the United Nations, people said you will never get this sentence passed because it's too simple, it's too categorical. But the delegates, after having seen all the evidence that we have observed and the causal chain between causes and effects, they have accepted this sentence and I could gavel it down within less than a minute. Let me now turn to the third aspect of our summary for policymakers. Probably the most important part of it concerns the future. And I should be precise, I should use this word in plural, because what we do as scientists is not defining one future, that is for society to define. We are offering scenarios and we are informing what happens if your decisions today are such as such, what happens in the future. For this, we use the climate models. And these climate models are run using different emission scenarios. For simplicity, I just show you here two of the scenarios, a business as usual scenario shown in red and a mitigation scenario respecting uh, a climate target that is limiting the warming to less than two degrees relative to pre-industrial in blue. 
On the left-hand side, you see the historical simulations from 1950 to the year 2005, and the uh, projection then for the 21st century. It is clear that continued emissions will cause further warming and changes in all components of the climate system. And these climate models now offer us the possibility to delve really deeply into the various components of the climate system and inform us about the changes that are to occur depending on the emission scenario. For example, here, the change in surface temperature over the globe, where you see that uh, warming is enhanced over the continents and subdued over the oceans, because the ocean render actually a service to us by soaking up a lot of heat, taking up a lot of heat, warming um, the waters and the deeper layers of the ocean. As you can see from this graph, the warming is particularly accentuated in the high northern latitudes, something particularly relevant for this country here in the Arctic for this high emission scenario that is depicted here. You see mean temperature changes in excess of 7 degrees Celsius. Now, for the first time, IPCC has also produced an atlas of global and regional climate projections. This atlas is available to everybody. All the data derived from the climate model simulations are on the web, free of charge. And I've just extracted the regions that are relevant here to Edmonton, indicated approximately by this star here. For the two scenarios, the mitigation scenario on the left and the business as usual scenario on the right. And we show annual mean temperature increase over the period um, uh, from 1985 to 2002 to the last 20 years of the 20 first century. You see in the mitigation scenario we have approximately a warming of 1.5 degrees to 2 degrees, whereas in the business as usual scenario that warming is in excess of about 5 degrees Celsius. What is more disturbing is that it's not temperature only as might be suggested by the term global warming. But everything else changes as well in the climate system. And foremost, the hydrological cycle, one of the primary resource for us and for ecosystems. You see here in blue colors the increase in percent of precipitation by the end of the 21st century. In brown colors, the decrease in percent of precipitation. You can recognize that areas that are already wet today become wetter, that is primarily in the mid and high latitudes of the planet and in the tropics. But those areas that are already dry and challenged with droughts and water shortage will become even drier. Take, for example, the Mediterranean area, northern Africa, parts of Central Africa, Northern South America, Central America and Australia, all showing brown colors on the order of 10 to 30 percent decrease of precipitation relative to today. Again, out of this atlas, I show you here the changes in precipitation for uh, the uh, mitigation scenario on the left and the business as usual scenario on the right. Edmonton for the mitigation scenario is very close to not being able to actually distinguish the changes in precipitation from the natural variability today. This is indicated by the hatch pattern that you see just touches Edmonton from the south. However, for the business as usual scenario, we get changes in precipitation of between 10 to 20 percent annual, uh, an increase indeed because you are uh, in the high latitudes, as you sure know. Now, often we are asked, why can you actually make quantitative statements in a system that is so immensely complicated, consisting of the atmosphere, the ocean, the cryosphere, vegetation, etc.? 
It turns out that science, in particular physics, offers us some very powerful tools to make statements and to make robust statements. These tools are called conservation laws. And with these conservation laws, we are able to make statements. For example, we have learned that the totality of all carbon dioxide emissions since the Industrial Revolution, that is, since about 1750, determines the warming in the 21st century. So we have a very simple measure of relating all man's activity to the effect of warming and therefore all the other effects that are a cause of the warming. We can quantify that by saying that a thousand billion tons of carbon will cause a warming of approximately 0.8 to 2.5 degrees Celsius. This is a linear relationship between the amount of emissions, of total emissions, and the warming, a fact that is also written in the summary for policymakers. And that has enormous consequences that are policy relevant, because you conclude immediately from this insight that any cl climate target that society agrees is actually linked intrinsically with a limited carbon budget. And the question now is, how big is that budget? And if so, how much of that budget remains? This is one of the last headline statements that we have placed in our summary for policymakers and that has been adopted by all governments of the world. Limiting climate change will require substantial and sustained reductions of greenhouse gas emissions. There is no way around this sentence if if society decides to limit climate change. Now the budget for the two degree target is 790 approximately billion tons of carbon. CO2 emissions until 2013 total 535 billion tons of carbon, which very simply puts us in the position to have available still 255 billion tons of carbon. Now this number may not tell us very much. I have to put this number into a context. And I take the context that I've already told you at the beginning of this short presentation, and that is the emissions today worldwide. For example, in 2010, we have emitted about 10 billion tons of carbon. So it's rather, rather simple, actually, to realize from these numbers the urgency of the problem. If, in other words, we want to limit the warming to more, no more than 2 degrees Celsius global mean, it remains about 25 years of present-day emissions until we will have missed this target. So here, as a summary, this is the two-degree world as depicted by the climate models. On top, the temperature increase. On the bottom, the change in precipitation. Precipitation changes in many areas not distinguishable from natural variability today. This is an important message for adaptation capacity. This world will be different, and adaptation will be necessary. But this world will be fundamentally different from what we know today. In fact, in many parts of the world, there are today no analogies of that world to come, both in terms of temperature and in terms of precipitation. The fact that I put these worlds, these two worlds in front of you means that today we have a choice. The choice is ours, the choice is that of the global society and I thank you for your attention. You made the case almost in passing, the role of the scientist. The scientist is there to crunch the data, to look at the projections. It's for others to decide. Do you ever get frustrated in that role? I certainly do get frustrated if I look at the pace of uh, how our knowledge actually 
osmotically pervades society. Uh, because basically the fundamental knowledge uh, has been around for the last 20 years. We've lost a lot of time. But then again, I have hope because I'm not only a scientist, I'm also a citizen. And in the capacity as citizen, you, you, uh, we have a question at the, the microphone there. I just briefly um, repeat the question because I'm not sure it has been heard in, in the audience here. The question concerns the last 500 years. 500 years ago was part of the Little Ice Age, a natural uh, climate state that was a little bit colder than today, not really with a, a worldwide uh, uh, spread as we uh, look at the warming uh, today. Now, how do you explain that? How do the models explain that? That is an essential part of our report. Uh, uh, we have a chapter on paleo uh, climate and its understanding as well as model evaluations. Both uh, uh, chapters go in, in great depth and length into this uh, pertinent question. The result is that this was a natural uh, part of variation of the climate caused by variations of the solar uh, energy input into the planet plus a series of volcanic events plus the normal natural variability that is with us also today. Uh, remember we are talking about uh, temperature changes of less than about one degree Celsius which is of the same order of magnitude already of the warming that we have seen in the past 112 years and is about four times smaller than the warming that we're projecting for the 21st century. So we have to put that into perspective. Next question at the microphone. Uh, if any, for the uh, solar radiation management geoengineering in the future. I haven't understood perfectly the first part of the question, but I heard solar radiation management yes. and geoengineering. And the, the first part was what role do you see, if any, for those technologies? Um, this is a very uh, uh, difficult question for two reasons. First of all, uh, the science is not really well developed. Uh, we have a few modeling studies that look at solar radiation management. And it turns out that these simulations indicate that they are indeed capable of producing a cooling that could offset the warming in the 21st century uh, by uh, basically humans playing volcano on a regular basis and putting a lot of soot up into the stratosphere. But at the same time, these simulations indicate something very dangerous, and that is changes to the water cycle that are associated with this delivery of soot into the stratosphere, changes that are not really intended and that are uh, having a very regional uh, expression. In other words, we would actually put uh, some regions by uh, this uh, management uh, uh, methodology into uh, uh, increased difficulties with respect to the carbon cycle and therefore uh, to the water cycle and therefore it comes down to a question of stewardship of this planet and governance and uh, these are ethical questions, questions that are uh, by far resolved. So no big hope for solar radiation management. Question from the back microphone number three. Hello. Um, we see that you're producing regional maps now. Uh, how far do you think downscaling can go? And how do you see that linking in with uh, the activities of local groups that are doing that type of downscaling, like PKIX and, and other Canadian groups? Thank you very much. Downscaling is a very important activity that helps policymakers in regions and in uh, uh, areas uh, to make decisions. Uh, it's the only methodology that uh, uh, allows you to quantify the changes in temperature, precipitation and other quantities. Uh, it turns out that we have performed such a study for Switzerland, which is arguably much more complex in terms of topography uh, than the area around here. And uh, we uh, are able to actually uh, show rather statistically robust uh, uh, changes that can be analyzed and are of uh, uh, very high value to uh, local decision makers. Uh, the fact that these regional climate model projections become better and better actually also improves the quality of the downscaling. Do, do you think it also makes the problem potentially more real to the extent that they can say this is happening in my backyard? Absolutely. This is uh, actually also a communication uh, uh, issue. Uh, if you can 
basically do the cause and effect chain not only on a global level as I have shown but on a local level uh, this is uh, much more powerful. Question at microphone too. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to know why you guys chose 800,000 years as how far you go back. Uh, I mean the earth has been there for longer than that obviously and I mean why not consider ice ages? I mean, I'm guessing there are warm periods after an ice age. So have you guys made those correlations? And I'm pretty sure you have, but I just wanted you to expand on that maybe. Thank you. Thank you very much for this question. We do go back further in time, obviously, but uh, the, there is a distinct qualitative difference of the data that I've shown you and the data that goes uh, before 800,000 years. The reason is that in fact the polar ice cores from Greenland and Antarctica offer us true samples of atmospheric composition stored in bubbles entrapped in the ice matrix. We are analyzing that old air and since the ice is no older at the moment than 800,000 years, that's the oldest ice we found in Antarctica, um, that's uh, the end of that uh, sort of high quality CO2 reconstruction. But there are indirect reconstructions based on many uh, geological uh, methodologies that indicate changes that go back many millions of years. Question at microphone three. Uh, could you characterize the response of government and business to your latest report? Thank you very much. Um, this report is only one of actually three reports that uh, within the last few days are all completed now. Uh, we had an approval plenary of the third report in Berlin uh, last week. The second report looks at impacts and vulnerabilities of climate and to climate change, uh, focusing on human and ecosystems. And the third report looks at mitigation of climate change and technological transformation. Um, to our first report, the governments have been very welcoming. Um, uh, the message has been really received uh, rather well, uh, also spread in the media. It's a little bit too early to um, gauge the reaction of the governments to the two most recent reports on impact and vulnerability and mitigation since they've been out only for uh, one or uh, three weeks. So we do hope that these reports provide a scientific input for informed decisions when it comes to the next climate conferences of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, this year in Peru and next year the most important conference in Paris, uh, a conference that should um, result in, in, a, in a new treaty uh, post-Kyoto. Uh, Question on uh, microphone number three. I appreciated your um, depiction of the two worlds with a two degree rise and a 4.5 degree rise. I think we need simple models to try to grasp it on a day to day level. And at the same time as human beings we want to continue simplifying. I, I wonder if we don't see that as 4.5 as the bad world and the 2.0 as the good world given that's what we're choosing from. But could you speak to the level of disruption that we're going to have to deal with and the impacts even if it's a two degree world given that we're not on track for that in the first place? Thank you very much. Uh, in the two degree world, I said it is a different world from today. There are processes that may actually disrupt uh, also in the two degree world. Uh, one of the most prominent one is the committed melting of the Greenland ice sheet, which would result over the course of many centuries to come into increased sea level rise. This is probably the most prominent uh, process that scientists uh, now have robust indication and an understanding of the processes that uh, there are uh, uh, thresholds in the Greenland ice sheet uh, which may be crossed even uh, at temperatures uh, between one degrees and four degrees of warming. In terms of uh, extreme events uh, which are also uh, uh, quite important for societies and communities because that is where the vulnerability today lies, we see already in a two degree world uh, significant changes in the statistics for example of heat waves and heavy precipitation events all of which uh, are challenges to to the societies around the world. Changes in frequencies as much as a factor of four even in a world that is only warmer by about two degrees. 
Last question from the floor for this session at microphone two. Professor Stalker, thank you very much for a very impressive uh, presentation. The science is undeniable, but at the same time, we are all hooked on hydrocarbons. You have a whole room of addicts here, and we are, we are living in a world on its way to nine billion people. And those of the nine billion who are not yet hooked on hydrocarbons are very happy to join the crowd and the party very soon. So we have a problem. What is your indication of the probability that in a transition period in the next 20 to 30 years, we will be able to go to 2%? Because if I hear you, I actually get the indication that we are on our way to 4.5% degrees increase. So what is the probability and what needs to be done because people in general will not change their behavior. We are living in the modern version of the old Greek tragedy, the Midas, King Midas, everything I touched turned into gold. And at the end you could not live. What is your advice to the world and what is your, 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 your indication of the probability? Thank you very much for, for this important question, which would require a, a rather lengthy response, and I'm afraid we don't have time, but I, I give you this. Um, yes, indeed, uh, two degrees has become an extremely ambitious climate target. It's not impossible, but it has become extremely ambitious because we have lost time, uh, as I mentioned 40 years ago, the relevant information from the climate science was on the table. Uh, we knew where we were heading to. All the measurements were in place. Um, two degrees has become extremely ambitious. It's not impossible. But by looking at our experience, if we wait for another 10 years, the 2.5 degree will by then have become as ambitious as now the two degrees. The three degrees soon will be as ambitious as today. And the message today is really we should start now. We should innovate now. We know basically the products that we need in the future. And uh, this conference, I understand, is precisely to accelerate that process. If you look back 20 years from today, who could have predicted the amount of progress in many areas? For example, the digital revolution. We would not have predicted that. And, and this is actually the opportunity of some hope that the next 20 years will also uh, uh, help us uh, innovate. But this will certainly not happen by us waiting. 